So, hello everyone, and welcome you very much to this session that we're organizing with the MIT Digital Currency Initiative and uh, the Central Bank Research Association. Uh, I'm also the president of uh, Zebra and uh, very much wanted to thank MIT, Debbie, uh, Athanasios and, and Deirdre for, for the great uh, organization thus far. Um, and we're now starting it, the, the CBDC part of today's program. Uh, Neha Narula, the director of MIT's Digital Currency Initiative, and I will be giving short talks. I will focus on uh, CBDC approaches around the world. Um, and, and Nea will then talk about uh, CBDC architectures and privacy. Um, I'm going to share my screen briefly. Um, so, so this is uh, this is a, a work that we've I've done with S colleagues John Frost and Panelli. Uh, it's it's our personal work and it it doesn't reflect the views of the BS. Um, and certainly, right, we we live in quite special times. Uh, cashews had been falling already for decades. You can see that on the left hand side uh, from the payment diaries of a couple of central banks. But with the pandemic, there was suddenly a fear that banknotes and coins could transmit the virus. Uh, you can see that here, these are Google searches over time for combinations of virus and banknotes or virus and coins. Or, and and these, these searches were actually present before the pandemic already. They, they were there during swine flu and MERS COVID, but you cannot even see previous spikes once you compare it to the the spike uh, amidst COVID-19. And certainly, I mean, we, we don't need to um, debate that much. Very few of us have, have used cash very substantially in recent times. And, and for a central bank, that's re that really opens uh, a substantial problem in the term, in the sense that cash has really been the ultimate payment means, the safest pay, uh, payment option that was always available. And in some jurisdictions, its acceptability is now on the threat. On the right-hand side, I'm, I'm showing a, um, a picture from Sweden where um, the, uh, the, the, the legal mandate from cash to accept cash is, is not very strong. And as a result, there are many merchants who no longer accept it. And central banks are reacting to that. And today I'm just going to be briefly speaking about which countries are looking into CBDC research and development and what are their designs. Uh, and and uh, importantly, this is a, a working paper from, from last year, but we're updating it. And actually an updated database as of the start of July will be posted on the BIS webpage a bit later today. It, it hasn't been posted just yet, but just a, a few hours later. And, and to give you an overall timeline of the trends that we can see in the data, I first want to direct your attention to the solid line here. Those are the, the speeches uh, that central bank governors and board members take, get, deliver on the subject of digital currencies. And on, and, and we measure the stance of whether they are positive on the stance on CBDC issuance or negative. So we measure the tone. And, and as you can see, people started talking about CBDC in, in 2018, but they overwhelmingly took a negative stance. So they, they were discussing the topic, but they actually said, we do not need it. Uh, that has shifted a bit around late 2018 and, and late 2019 with the announcement of some corporate stablecoin projects. And then it really moved into positive territory once the pandemic hit. We've also seen research on retail and wholesale CBDC. Um, here we plot the not the number, but sort of the cumulative score where we give a higher score for, for a pilot than for research on retail and wholesale pro projects. And we really see there is a continuous and accelerating increase. At current, uh, 53 uh, central banks are looking into either retail or wholesale CBDC. If, if we look at the state of affairs today, um, we see there are even two live CBDCs, the, the Hamasant dollar and the ECCB Dcash in the Caribbean. Uh, in, in other parts of the world, obviously, uh, the, the, the E1 pilot of, of the PBC has received ample attention. The um, 
there were uh, lots of um, countries where we have a lot of research, uh, much is focused on, re on retail, but there is actually a number of countries that are simultaneously looking into uh, retail and wholesale CBDC at the same time. Those are the purple colored countries on this world map. Um, so much just on the numbers, but we, we can sort of also look into sort of what the uh, design is that these central banks are looking at and what that would imply for the structure of the monetary and financial system. And the um, uh, we need to start this from the concept of a CBDC. What is a CBDC by definition? And then how can you set it up operationally? So let's start with the concept. And, and a CBDC is a direct legal claim on the central bank, just like cash, but it is available in digital form. And that is quite distinct from today's electronic money, which is always a form, a, a legal claim on an intermediary. It could be on a commercial bank, it could be on some other payment service providers, but it's always a, a claim on an intermediary and only these intermediaries then have a digital claim on the central bank. A CBDC is the concept to make this direct legal claim available in electronic form to the economy at large rather than just a subset of, of regulated financial institutions. So the claim has to be direct, but that doesn't mean that the information structure has to be. And, and let me start here with an idea that sort of the, na the naive CBDC setup that people have in mind. Here we have end users, they have legal claims on the central bank, and they also, the central bank handles all the communications in the sense that it onboards consumers, it, uh, uh, it handles KYC, it handles dispute resolution, and it maintains a full ledger of each and every transaction in this economy, right? This is the only form in which a central bank could maintain such a payment system on its own, and we call this the direct CBDC. Obviously, it's not a very attractive concept because it completely crowds out the private sector, uh, and, and the important trick is that you can analyze, uh, ar arrange it very differently because you can separate the legal claims from the information structure. How does that work? In, in another variant, the intermediated CBDC, it is private uh, sector uh, payment providers who actually maintain the, the full record of accounts. Uh, they maintain all the relationships with the users and they only pass on the wholesale information to the central bank. So uh, payment service provider X says, my clients hold 4.6 million currency units in CBDC. And the central bank then has a, a much simpler uh, operational setup. And this design features pr pr private parties just as today's. It's just that they don't have a balance sheet on which people transact. They just handle the record of who owns which uh, CBDC. And, and this might seem strange at first place that their people have claim on the central bank, but the central bank doesn't know which agent has which claim at the, at the moment. But we should keep in mind that it's the same with cash, right? The central bank knows there is a certain amount of cash out there. It doesn't know who owns which banknote. So this is possible and it's possible also in digital form. There are also um, other versions, a hybrid CBDC where the private sector performs the payment by default, uh, but the central bank sort of maintains a backup which gives it additional resilience options. Um, in our stock take, we, we, we look at all published uh, central bank reports and at what kind of architectures uh, the, the, the central banks actually pursue. And we find that uh, the, by, by and large, all those that look into, of, of those that look into designs, most haven't yet decided. Some saying uh, we, we will consider multiple architectures simultaneously and then consider, uh, determine a winner. But of those that have sort of picked a design already, it's those with the two-tired design that involve an important role for the private sector that are uh, that are is, is the most frequently thought design. Um, we can also go further and and once we've sort of looked into the architecture, uh, who does what, 
from a conceptual point of view in this CBDC setup? What is the architecture, uh, uh, sorry, what is the infrastructure that the central bank should use? Um, uh, we split it up by DLT based or conventional infrastructure. How would people get access to the system? Could it be anonymous? That's what we call token based. Or would it be fully identified, so account based? And is a CBDC designed primarily for the domestic market or does it from the get go uh, feature uh, an interoperability aspect across borders to facilitate inexpensive cross border payments? And, and the full st stock case is, is a stock take uh, is, is that um, as of now, again, when it comes to the infrastructure, most central banks are leaving that open. Of those, some are pursuing multiple approaches. Of those that have decided a specific one, uh, it's uh, about even conventional technologies and DLT. However, I want to notice here that had I shown you this graph half a year ago, uh, DLT would have been ahead. So there has been a swing to conventional. Uh, also, when it comes to uh, sort of uh, do, how do people get access, how much privacy uh, will the system allow? Again, many undecided, but uh, of those that have decided, an interesting trend is, is this mixed uh, design where the CBDC would allow for fully anonymous uh, transactions for low value payments and then identification for higher value uh, payments. And, and this is again, a new development that this mixed uh, form of access is gaining traction. On interlinkages, um, uh, again, right, all the options are about evenly uh, represented. Uh, there is, a, again, an underlying important trend is that the intrinsic motivation for CBDC design has in all cases been the domestic one. And now we see a certain shift that the international dimension is gaining more traction. And this is also coming in like from a development uh, of the G20 endorsed cross-border payments agenda that uh, that uh, the, the international community tries to foster. So uh, let me conclude here. Maybe I, I have time to answer one or two questions. Uh, around the world, CBDC designs are intensifying. A wide range of options are being considered, but the tendency is that all CBDC designs we actually examine will want to complement cash rather than replace it. Most want to offer a solution with an important role for the private sector uh, and aim for an economic design that will not append the two-tire financial system so that will feature uh, uh, an important role for, for commercial banks. And uh, I want to conclude here before maybe t going to some questions. Um, to, uh, on, the, on the policy debate, the, the BIS just published its annual economic report special chapters on CBDCs and opportunity for the monetary system, where we really discuss the issues of competition, data governance and privacy and integrity of the payment system. And I think it's worth a read. Um, There are a couple of questions. Let me actually um, answer the easiest one and maybe actually Neha can chime in, in on that later. Why are central banks swinging away from DLT? And I think the important point here is um, why should a CBDC is, is a concept to make central bank money uh, available to the general public in, in some form, in, in the electronic form. And we actually shouldn't be starting with any technology in mind. That's not what we do as policy institutions, right? I mean, engineers will do that and pick up winning technologies. But I think central banks should just look into all uh, technologies. And, and, and here, the, the important point is that the initial trials, I think, were very much motivated by cryptocurrencies. And so that's the technology that people started with. And then later they all, they realized, well, we shouldn't be looking into this te specific technology. We should be looking into our policy goals and, and make tenders that, that, that say, well, we want to reach a couple of policy goals and any technology that can reach it is fine. Um, the, uh, let me, I'm, I'm already one minute over time. Let me stop here. I'll, I'll type the answers uh, later and let me pass on to Neha. Uh, I, uh, maybe one concluding remark is that we'll, we'll, we'll have a panel after this one on CBDC that I highly recommend everybody following. 
and uh, we will you can access it via the uh, event squid link or you can um, you can also uh, look in the chat window here and Deirdre will post that zoom link there thank you very much and Neha please take it away thank you Raphael um, there we go. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's very nice to be here with you today. Um, my name is Neha Narula, and I'm the director of the Digital Currency Initiative based here at MIT out of the MIT Media Lab. Um, I'm going to dive right in since Raphael gave that great introduction and overview. Um, there are three key messages that I would like to leave you with today. First of all, CBDC design choices are much more fine grained and nuanced than commonly assumed. Second, there are very new exciting opportunities that are available here. Uh, in fact, novel functionalities are possible and certain legacy trade-offs can be addressed, but they actually introduce new challenges. And most importantly, research is really needed in this space. I do not think that the solutions that will eventually implement CBDC are fully baked yet. Uh, and in particular, dedicated technical research is needed and should be embedded very early on in policy discussions. So I 100% agree with Raphael that it's very important to think about what you might want to build first and how you might want the CBDC to look. Um, but I do think that technical discussions have a role to play in that as well, because the technology enables what might even be possible. So, um, and this is the type of work that we're doing here at MIT and the Digital Currency Initiative. We're engaging in technical research to understand how to design a CBDC. Uh, and so this is going to go a bit of a level deeper. So assuming you're already a little bit interested in this, it's not going to cover why you might want to launch one, for example, or what the benefits of one might be. But I'm going to so, sort of solely focus on some of the technology questions and decisions and what they enable. So, um, so far, unfortunately, uh, CBDC design choices have been greatly oversimplified, and this has sort of hijacked a lot of economist and policymaker attention. Uh, coarse grained binary choices have led to wasteful debate and limited innovation. And there's sort of two examples of this. Um, one is this uh, conversation around token versus account. And the other is this conversation around uh, using distributed ledger technology or DLT versus traditional conventional infrastructure. So let's just dive very briefly into the token versus account question. Now you've probably heard that um, a CBDC must be designed in one of two ways. You either have a token based architecture or an account-based architecture. So as we start to dive a little bit deeper and look at some papers and, and, and figure out what they actually mean by these words, they, we see the following. So uh, Charles Kahn has a paper in 2016, which um, uses these two words and defines them as terms that are indicating ownership or authentication. So the idea here is that what's commonly referred to as token is a bearer instrument, um, something where mere possession indicates that you have the authority to then spend that further on. Um, whereas something that's, uh, you know, account-based, a payment system that's account-based is custodial and relies on a third party identifying an individual to determine if they have the authorization to spend or if they actually own the funds. Um, Raphael Auer just spoke and Rainer Bohm uh, take this a bit further and talk about just about authentication when speaking about token versus account. So whether something's authenticated via digital signature or identity credentials. Um, the Reichsbank paper defines a token as a sequence of bits. So they don't even define an account in, in this particular paper. Um, and uh, in a paper by Chaum and the Swiss National Bank, they define a token as a value and issuer, whereas an account is a transaction history. So here in this paper, they're really focusing on the history and the data of, of the transaction transactions. Um, computer scientists, of which I am one, uh, approach this in a from a completely different perspective. Uh, we think about it in terms of the data model. So, uh, and this comes from the cryptocurrency world. So a token is something that is destroyed once spent and new tokens are created. Whereas um, an, an account-based model, we think about balances. So incrementing and decrementing balances. So you see here, this really has nothing to do with whether it's a bearer instrument or not. It doesn't even really necessarily have to do with um, authentication or ownership. It's really a about the data model. 
Now, unfortunately, uh, these two terms have been conflated to mean many, many other different things. Like here, I've already said four different things that they, the definitions for token versus account. Um, if we look at some other papers, for example, there's a paper by Citibank. Um, they use token and account to conflate many, many different ideas, uh, ranging from are there intermediaries involved to what is the interface? What is the architecture? Is there privacy? Does it require identification? Does it work offline? Um, and unfortunately, these, these things are not binary choices. It's actually possible to achieve almost all combinations of these things. And by that, I mean that one could imagine using a system that uses conventional architecture, for example, a traditional database that also supports smart contracts or that has um, privacy and anonymity. So really, this, this type of language has unfortunately, I think, set us back a bit in this debate. And, um, and so what I want to encourage in this conversation is to really, instead of focusing on the architecture choices, and this is just reiterating what Raphael has already said, focus on the outcomes and fine grained design choices that will then impact your choice of architecture. So, um, you know, really think that this is the best way to approach this. Um, and so let's look at some of those examples. Um, so technology can enable exciting new functionality. And here are two examples of where technology can do things in payments that have not been done before. So one is in the area of privacy and compliance. So achieving things like traceability and measurements while at the same time preserving the privacy of uh, a fine-grained transaction data. Why is privacy important? Well, data is very, very sensitive. And in particular, financial transaction data can be very revealing. Um, wherever data is gathered, it is then vulnerable to attack. Uh, whoever has data then has the potential to monetize or sell, further sell that data. So privacy is really important to think about. Um, the next uh, example of new functionality is in programmability. So this is the idea that we can bundle new conditional events and functionality with transactions or payments. Why is programmability interesting? Well, uh, programmability gives us the potential to remove intermediaries um, and improve efficiency, potentially reducing costs. So programmability can be very helpful in that respect. Um, so cryptographic techniques can help us achieve privacy while meeting compliance goals. However, they actually introduce new challenges. So let me give you some examples. So two goals in any payment system are authorization and monitoring. And by this, I mean, how might we check permissions without seeing and storing sensitive user information. So in traditional systems today, authorization is generally done by seeing everything about a user, KYC. But um, how might we do this without requiring an entity to see all of this data? And in, similarly, in the transaction monitoring realm, right now, transactions are monitored using intermediaries who see all of the transaction information, including who's involved, where the transactions originate, um, pretty much everything about them is seen by these intermediaries. Is there a way to detect suspicious activity without necessarily seeing and storing a full transaction history? And the answer is that there are very promising technical approaches. Now, these are still in progress. And these approaches generally are a combination of two things. Number one, interesting cryptographic primitives uh, that are not necessarily novel, though perhaps their performance has been improved over the last decade, and very careful system design. So what do I mean by this? Let's take a look at authorization, for example. Uh, so if our goal here is to check to see if a transaction is authorized, meaning the user is you know, authorized to make payments, it's not too big, it's not going to a sort of destination that it shouldn't be receiving money, um, there is a way to do that without actually having to have an entity see all of the fine-grained transaction data. And that is uh, a careful design which separates roles. So right now, all of this uh, functionality might fall on the intermediary. So, and in, in usually a commercial bank, for example, would have to actually collect all of this information and look at it and uh, file SARS, for example, if they think any of it was being violated. However, we can actually think about separating these roles, particularly in the design of a CBDC, which gives us the ability to do it uh, anew. And we can use interesting cryptographic primitives like anonymous credentials, which let a user prove that they have been authorized to do something without revealing exactly who they are or what that 
authorization is. Uh, similarly, with transaction monitoring, there's the potential to, um, to use cryptographic primitives called zero knowledge proofs to allow a transaction to sort of self validate or verify. A transaction itself can present the information necessary, a proof, if you will, that says that it has passed certain uh, restrictions or conditions. So a careful design, a combination of systems design plus cryptographic primitives can uh, opens a new avenue, so to speak. Um, another area where there's really interesting, exciting new potential is with programmability. So programmability can enable things like what I've listed here on the left, atomic transactions. So multiple payments that either occur or don't occur in their entirety, no partial payments. Uh, escrow without a third party, for example, with payment versus payment, this could remove the need for intermediaries like CLS, which is very exciting. Um, so the ability to actually settle payments going two different ways without an intermediary. Uh, conditional payments and interoperability. However, this new functionality introduces new challenges as well, uh, some of which people might not be speaking about as much. So for example, uh, with this new functionality comes an increased complexity and therefore attack surface. So it's important to think about cybersecurity. Um, this new functionality can affect scalability. Uh, there's a limited potential to then use some of those cryptographic techniques I just described for privacy in concert with programmability. And uh, something that I don't see talked about very much at all is that um, once you start to enable some of these things, once you start to enable some of this programmability and functionality, then um, it's almost like opening Pandora's box. Uh, the tools for, needed for one functionality could then be used for other functionality that, that one didn't anticipate. So it's actually quite important to do the technical research necessary to understand uh, what, how, how any small piece of functionality might then be used more broadly. And we are, we are only beginning to crack the surface of a lot of this technical research, which is very important. So um, the third point that I wanted to leave you with today is that there's much more research needed to capture these new opportunities instead of simply recreating legacy systems. So there is a, there's a lot of opportunity here um, to solve challenges from our legacy systems in new ways because we're thinking about something that is essentially a ground up redesign. Uh, but there are, are still a lot of challenges to solve. The technology is not there yet and, there are, um, and it deserves this time and attention uh, in order to build something truly transformative and groundbreaking. Uh, central banks will need to either build the internal capacity or heavily collaborate and partner in order to evaluate different potential technologies for CBDC and to manage and build their own CBD systems. Traditionally, central banks have not had this type of technical capacity. So this is something uh, quite new and that, that we have to figure out how to do. Um, limited technical research to date has been hindering, I think, policy discussions because it hasn't been uncovering this new level of nuance. Uh, policy and technical research shouldn't be separated. They are deeply interlinked. Um, so payment redesign can drive policy outcomes with the right use of technology. Uh, and the three key messages I want to leave you with are that there are a lot of very fine grained granular choices which we need to uncover and get into. Um, there are many new exciting opportunities both to um, address legacy trade offs and implement new functionality but this also introduces a new layer of challenges and uh, definitely more technical research is needed in concert with policymakers and economists in order to really uncover where the technology might be more effective, uh, most effective to drive policy outcomes. So I will pause there and then turn it back over to Raphael um, to determine if we have time to address questions or not. Thank you. Um, we are um, out of time and maybe, I mean, there is one open question. Why are central banks swinging away from DLT? I gave an answer and I think you then nailed it. Uh, the, the, we, we have no further questions and we have in five minutes, uh, the next session that is very related to what we're speaking about, CBDC and the future of payments. The, loom, the Zoom link is in the chat, but if we have one more question, uh, we could maybe give it a go. No, we don't. Then uh, thank you very much, Neha. I, I, I learned something. At some point, we need to write something to nail the token versus account discussion across all fields. Um, and 
I look forward to seeing everybody in the next room, which I will now join. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nia.